Okay, so um, let's let's get started then. Um, so as I say, my name is Declan Highland. I'm a consultant general adult psychiatrist, uh, and I work at Clotby Hospital in Liverpool. Uh, I'm also the School of Medicine Specialist Lead for General Adult Psychiatry. Um, and I'm going to spend a bit of time talking to you today about uh, bipolar affective disorder. Um, and I think it's important that you've got a, a good general knowledge of this particular mental disorder because you'll see an awful lot of it in whatever sphere of uh, medicine you go into. So whether that's surgery, general medicine or, or general practice, uh, even paediatrics, um, you know, there are uh, often teenagers diagnosed with bipolar affective disorder. So um, it's important that you've got a decent grasp of this particular uh, mood disorder. OK, so what I'm going to do, hopefully, over the next hour is give you a brief overview uh, of bipolar affective disorder. And um, if you've got any questions, just uh, post them in the um, chat box. And probably what I'll do, what would be easiest for me to do, would be to address them all at the end rather than as I go along. So uh, if you have any questions, just feel free to leave them in the um, the chat box facility and I'm happy to have a look at them at the end um, and um, yeah if you've got any other questions about any of the talks prior to this one again I'm happy to, to try and answer them as well. Okay so um, what is bipolar disorder first and foremost? Well you know I guess uh, to the lay person this is what we call manic depression. Um, and I think the nice thing about that particular term is it, it kind of describes quite nicely what we mean by bipolar affective disorder. Um, it describes the two uh, holes, if you like, of mood, that of mania of being really high and that of depression being really low. Um, but one of the things with bipolar affective disorder, it can be really difficult to diagnose. And, and there's been a lot of research looking at uh, how long it takes people to receive the diagnosis of bipolar affective disorder. Um, and, you know, what sort of lag period is there um, from the first episode, uh, or, you know, from the first particular mood episode to that diagnosis actually being formally made. Uh, and research has shown that can, that lag period can be as long as 10 years. And one of the chief reasons for this is that a lot of people who have bipolar affective disorder uh, may be more prone to depressive episodes um, and less prone to manic and hypermanic episodes. And there may be a long period between having a depressive episode and then a subsequent manic or hypermanic episode. So it may be incorrectly assumed that that particular uh, patient has um, recurrent depressive disorder rather than an actual uh, more accurate diagnosis of bipolar affective disorder. So, um, you know, we often see sort of first presentation, um, you know, around late teenage years, tends to be slightly earlier in females than males. Um, but what you tend to find in patients with bipolar affective disorder is that you get periods of profound low mood, what we call depression, and then these alternate with excessively elevated or irritable mood uh, mania. Um, and if I'm honest, I think, you know, probably see a lot more of the irritability, actually, um, in terms of sort of uh, manic presentations, particularly on the ward setting where I work. Uh, I mean, there, you know, I will have patients admitted uh, with mania who are clearly elevated and, and clearly uh, quite euphoric. But very often it's that irritability that that patient that shouts at you, uh, that doesn't want to listen to you, um, that won't let you interrupt them. That, that irritability is what you often more commonly find. And then you may have also heard of hypomania and um, hypomania essentially is very similar to mania, uh, but it's, it's a more dampened down form of mania. Okay. So it's a milder form um, and hypomania can often lead then into full blown manic states or patients may just present with hypomanic states. Uh, and people sometimes talk about bipolar one and bipolar two uh, disorder. And, and what they mean by that is in bipolar one, the patients who experience manic relapses as opposed to bipolar 2 where they experience hypomanic relapses. But there's another subclinical presentation you need to be aware of as well and this is called cyclothymia um, and this was historically thought of as being a, a particular type of personality disorder which I'm going to go on and talk to you about next. But this idea behind cyclothymia um, is that patients have this sort of fluctuation or variation in mood but not to the extent that they become hypomanic or to the extent that they become depressed. Um, so cyclothymia is something that we would see less commonly in secondary care, but that may well commonly present uh, within primary care. Uh, and such patients may well believe that they actually have bipolar affective disorder, um, probably because a lot of them haven't heard of the diagnosis of cyclothymia. So hopefully that's not a completely um, novel term to you today. <clears throat> 
So um, it's important to know how we classify bipolar affective disorder. And um, you'll have heard already about the ICD-10, uh, which is soon to be replaced by ICD-11. And effectively, the ICD-10 is the diagnostic Bible, if you like. So I'd highly recommend uh, that you obtain a copy. And it's um, easy enough to obtain. You can just Google it uh, and obtain it for free as a PDF. You haven't got to pay for it or anything like that. But if you look at what the ICD-10 says about bipolar affective disorder, there have to be at least two mood episodes. And at least one of them must be a hypomanic manic or mixed episode okay um and the criteria for the depressive episodes are the same as for unipolar depression uh, you'll have heard shagan talking to you before about depression prior to lunchtime um and although depression the, the depressive features within bipolar depression are the same the way we treat bipolar depression is actually uh, really quite different uh, and i'll come on to that a little bit later um we talk about mixed episodes. This is something that you don't commonly see in practice, but there are some patients who clearly present with both manic features and depressive features. Um, so they may well have the mania and agitation, but then something like reduced libido or reduced energy levels, or they may well be describing feeling low in mood, but have pressured speech and be overly active. Okay. Um, and there was also this thing called rapid cycling as well. So um, some patients with bipolar affective disorder have particularly rapid cycling. So what we mean by that, by definition, is that they have four or more mood episodes per year and they may be depressive, mixed, manic or hypomanic, but they, they often rapidly fluctuate between mania and depression. And they're the sorts of patients that are more uh, treatment and often uh, more mood stabilizing medication or perhaps two mood stabilizers rather than just one, uh, as in most patients with bipolar disorder. Um, and what about the um, epidemiology then? Well, it's really important to uh, consider that bipolar affective disorder is actually something incredibly common. So this affects about 1% of the UK population. Uh, and actually there's probably a lot of people with bipolar affective disorder uh, that are undiagnosed or diagnosed really quite late, but the average on age of onset is around 20. And as I say, in females, it tends to be uh, diagnosed at an earlier stage, three or four years earlier than in males. Okay. Um, now, unlike depression in, in bipolar disorder, the male to female ratio is, is approximately one to one. Um, and most of these patients who will have a single mood episode, uh, so either manic episode or hypermanic episode, will then go on to have further episodes. So it's really important that, you know, in the patient who presents with a first episode of mania or hypermania, uh, that you recognize that this may well go on to develop a, a, a diagnosis or uh, attract a diagnosis of bipolar affective disorder um, and you have to treat that person accordingly with mood stabilizing medication and it's important like with a lot of mental disorders to recognize that suicide is a big risk in this particular group of patients um, and we know that between 10 and 15 percent of patients with bipolar disorder will go on to complete suicide at some point in their lifetime and very often uh, the sort of rate of suicide or the risk of suicide if you like is highest following that diagnosis first being made. Uh, now, obviously, you've heard talks already um, this morning. One of them was on, on schizophrenia. And there's no doubt uh, in my mind, I'm sure your mind as well, that uh, whilst bipolar affective disorder doesn't attract the same level of stigma um, that schizophrenia does as a, as a diagnostic label, a lot of patients, when first given that diagnosis particularly, um, they can find it quite devastating. Um, and I think it's important to really emphasise to these patients that actually... Um, you know, there were lots of individuals with bipolar uh, disorder who were very successful, um, you know, and actually have a pretty much normal life, despite the fact they may well have mood episodes uh, at times. So what about um, what causes bipolar affective disorder? Well, one of the things that's uh, common in all mental disorders really is you get this um, gross interaction between genes and the environment. OK, so similar to depression, really, which you'll have heard of earlier. Um, and like with a lot of mental disorders, a large proportion of bipolar disorder is down to genes. Okay? And this is why it's really important to ask about family history, uh, not only of bipolar affective disorder, but of any other mental disorders. Okay? Because we know that in first degree relatives of people with bipolar affective disorder, there's a significantly increased risk of having the diagnosis. Okay? So um, very often it runs in, in families. Um, and you know, I see this in practice on the ward. And in terms of environmental risk factors, um, childbirth is a major 
uh, risk factor for uh, bipolar affective disorder. So risk of mania postpartum is very common. Uh, and in a woman with known bipolar affective disorder, following birth, there is an approximately 50% risk of that um, uh, woman going into uh, mania, into a, high, into a manic state. So it's really important to uh, plan um, almost prophylactically, if you like, and, and, and you know, think ahead as to recognising that could well be a, a, a risky time. Um, if you look at the brain in bipolar affective disorder, th th there are clearly some structural function abnormalities as well. And, and there's various parts of the cerebral cortex that have been identified as being uh, indicated and important in bipolar disorder. So I've highlighted some of them uh, here, and it's particularly those uh, parts of the cerebral cortex that are linked to emotion, okay? So the amygdala, what we call the emotional brain, okay? The hippocampus, corpus callosum, and the anterior cingulate. So um, those brain regions have been identified as being important uh, in terms of etiology of bipolar affective disorder, okay? And, you know, in the manic state, the hypermanic state, we see increased levels of monoamines, okay? So, um, you know, clearly neurotransmitters play an important role. Uh, behind uh, what causes manic states. So what do we mean by a manic episode or mania then? So um, in terms of how, how we define it, well, there is a duration um, uh, attached to it. And that if you look at the ICD-10, it states that an episode should last at least one week uh, or less if hospital admission is necessary. Now, in reality, uh, a lot of these patients uh, who become manic uh, may only be manic for two or three days uh, and it's it's quite clear that they're manic and that they need to come into hospital and they may well present to A and E uh, really quite quickly. Um, and certainly, uh, you know, my, my view is very much that if it looks like mania and it's lasting sort of several days, we don't need to uh, wait until that one week duration has been reached before saying, yeah, this is someone with a manic episode. But the important thing is recognizing that the mood is consistently elevated or irritable, okay? So this isn't someone who feels elevated or irritable in the mornings, but is fine in the afternoons and in the, in the evenings at night. I mean, it's, there's a consistent picture here across, uh, across the course of the day. So you don't get that diurnal variation uh, that you can sometimes find in depression. And the important thing in mania as well that differentiates it from hypomania is this disturbance uh, in both occupational and social functioning. So what you typically find with these patients is that they um, can't function at all uh, in terms of uh, work or in terms of, um, you know, being at college, uh, et cetera. And, and often family life becomes very disrupted and there are significant interpersonal conflicts uh, between different family members. And in mania, you may or may not have features of psychosis. So the way we diagnose this is mania with psychotic features or mania without psychotic features and it's important to have an understanding about what sort of psychotic features we're talking about here uh, and i know in your schizophrenia talk uh, this morning uh, krishna was talking a little bit about delusions and hallucinations well typically in uh, mania you get sort of grandiose delusional beliefs um, and uh, you may well get sort of auditory hallucinations that are very often sort of command in nature usually second or third person. So they're the kind of common psychotic features that, that may well be uh, present. Often manic patients will talk about having special uh, powers or special uh, gifts, um, you know, such as the fact that they can communicate with God or that they are psychic. Um, I've had a patient quite recently who told me that he was Jesus, um, you know, so they're very sort of grandiose uh, beliefs. And I've got a chap at the moment who believes he's the world's best uh, at a particular computer game and he's in the Guinness Book of Records because of it and I'm fairly certain that's not the case. So just in terms of clinical features I think it's really important that um, you know you have a, a sort of good grasp of this really because um, you know particularly in the exams you know we, we like to ask about you know what are the typical features seen in, in the manic patient or what might you expect to see uh, in the manic patient and I think this helps you to uh, identify that this is someone with mania as opposed to um, and the other diagnosis. And I've spoken already about that sort of elevated mood. And, and I think it's important that that's contextualized and that actually that elevated mood is very unusual for that particular person. So it's not someone who's naturally always that happy. So that's where it's often very helpful to get some collateral history. So 
one of the things I would always recommend is that you talk to uh, family members or spouse or, or you know brothers sisters whatever and ask you know is um, so and so always like this or has there been a significant shift or change in their mood okay and patients will often talk about uh, having really high energy levels uh, they'll often feel that they can do an awful lot more uh, and that actually um, you know they can't sit still and they may talk about sort of um, feeling sort of mentally that they they just can't rest but also physically okay or, or even both um, and when you talk to these patients what you often find is it's very difficult to interrupt them um, and that can make it quite difficult to uh, take a history from the manic patient or indeed to even establish any sort of rapport with the manic patient because they will often present with this pressure of speech and one of the things that I um, will often do with these patients when I'm uh, interviewing them on the ward and and seeing them particularly for the first time is just see how they respond to me deliberately interrupting them uh, and seeing whether or not that's something that they really struggle with or whether that's something that actually act, that can be done with, with, without too much difficulty or or be met without any sort of negativity or, or negative response from the patient and we talk about this idea of flight of ideas um, a flight of ideas is basically where the patient talks about something and then talks about something else that um, clearly closely related to what they previously talked about and then talks about something else that's uh, clearly related to what was previously spoken about. So the example I always use, uh, you know, in terms of flight of ideas is something like, my name's Declan, I, I come from Leeds, Leeds is a city in Yorkshire, Yorkshire is a county in England, England's a country in the UK, UK is in Europe, which is one of the seven continents. That's, that's what we mean by uh, flight of ideas. And these patients will often describe their thoughts racing. It feels like they're struggling to um, make sense of their thoughts. They're struggling to sort of organize their thoughts. And, and that can be really quite distressing for the patient. Um, and very often they uh, either don't sleep at all or sleep very little. And it's not uncommon um, for patients in a state of mania when they come into hospital to tell me that they've hardly slept for two or three days. Um, and, you know, for most people, that level of sleep deprivation would, would be you know, really quite uncomfortable and you feel incredibly tired and lethargic, but these patients don't feel tired. Um, so it's really important that when you ask them how much they're sleeping, and how many hours they're sleeping for, that actually you say, do you, you, know, do you feel refreshed in the mornings? Do you, do you feel like you've got energy for the day or, or are you feeling quite lethargic? And, and they will tell you that actually um, they, don't, uh, they don't feel they need sleep. Um, these patients will often be very uh, grandiose and have sort of very heightened self-esteem uh, and that can be quite challenging particularly um, you know for me as a consultant looking after that person on the ward um, often these patients will, will, will talk about being you know very uh, very intelligent you know much more intelligent than I am being better qualified than I am etc etc and that may well be the case obviously you know when you're meeting someone for the first time you know, you shouldn't take anything uh, at face value, but equally, you, you know, you should not assume that what they're saying uh, is clearly incorrect. Um, and that was really hammered home to me in a tribunal once when I had a manic patient who I believe was really quite grandiose, who spoke about having uh, 80,000 pounds in his bank and how he was going to purchase um, a load of land in Warrington and build some flats in it. And I thought, well, this is clearly a grandiose belief and, and not true. And, and this guy's solicitor in the tribunal said to me, well, I've known this uh, patient for sort of 10 years plus, and I can tell you that he does, he does have a lot of money. Uh, and actually this is a plan that he does have. So it's important to um, sense check, if you like, and, and just sort of check the validity of uh, any beliefs um, and thoughts that these, these patients have. And very often what you'll find with uh, manic patients is they're really quite socially disinhibited. And again, this is something you have to be really careful about. One of the things I would always say is to never see a manic patient on your own because very often they can be really quite over familiar um, and you know, very provocative in, in some of the things that they say or some of the things that they do. Um, so they may well be very invasive of your personal space. You know, they may want to sort of touch you. They want to know your first name. Uh, they want to know if you're married, whether you've got children. And, you know, I've had patients who sort of, you know, want to kiss your hand and, and you know, it can be really quite uncomfortable. Uh, I think particularly as a junior doctor, and um, it's something you have to be very careful about and you have to remind that patient about appropriate boundaries. Um, but we're often with these patients, that they, 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 these are uh, actions beyond their control. Um, and so they just generally present as really quite socially or even sometimes sexually disinhibited.
and they can be really quite facetious as well. And, and again, that can really affect how easy it is to form a rapport uh, with the patient. Um, and you know, it's it's very easy for these patients to really get under your skin and um, you know it, it evoke that what we call negative trans counter transference. And by that, what I mean is these kind of uh, negative feelings that that patients uh, cause within you that then um, you you then exhibit, and that that then uh, projects in terms of how you um, speak to the patient, how you interact with that patient. Uh, very often with these patients, if you um, ask them to do some sort of task that requires their attention or you ask them what their focus is like, um, it's very, very poor uh, and they're really quite distractible uh, and they really struggle to sort of stay on topic, uh, to remain focused. And again, that can make taking history quite difficult. And very often what you have to do is, is um, you know, really complete that process in a much more piecemeal way. Um, it's very unusual for you to be able to sit the manic patient down and talk to them for longer than maybe 10 or 15 minutes. Um, one of the things that we always uh, get concerned about in psychiatry is around risk. Um, and, you know, certainly in terms of areas of risk with these patients, uh, very often what you find is that they uh, rack up massive amounts of debt. Um, and, you know, the, the generally sort of spending money on things that they often don't need uh, or, you know, buying sort of uh, multiple pairs of shoes, clearly more than they're ever going to need to buy. Um, and, you know, I've, I've had patients who've got into uh, thousands and thousands of pounds worth of debt when they've been acutely manic. Um, I mean, I had a young chap once who racked up a £30,000 debt in Australia uh, when he was there travelling. He became acutely manic in Australia and his parents had to fly him back to the UK. Uh, and it took years to, to resolve that debt because he racked up about £30,000 uh, worth of debt. But these patients can also be quite promiscuous as well. Um, so obviously, you know, when we're thinking about a management plan, uh, you know, one of the things that we always think about um, with our patients when they come into hospice, not just their mental health, but also other aspects of their care, like sort of social uh, issues or psychological difficulties. Sexual health is a big one in, in manic and hypermanic patients, because often, you know, they, they will uh, require a sexual health screen. And that's something that shouldn't be neglected as part of that patient's treatment plan. That obviously has to be addressed at the most appropriate time. Um, but it's, it's really important that, that you don't neglect that. And um, these patients will often talk about having particular sort of uh, ideas or schemes uh, that seem really quite far fetched. And, and I, often if you get the patient to really explain, uh, you know, their, their scheme in a little bit more detail, it becomes more and more obvious that actually what, what they're sort of proposing is, is really quite implausible and very unlikely uh, to, um, to be feasibly delivered. Um, so what about other behavioural manifestations? I've already spoken about the irritability and, and you know, this is what I see very often on the wards. Um, and often that irritability can boil over into verbal hostility or verbal aggression or even physical aggression. And often with these patients, what can happen is they become very uh, invasive of the personal space of others and, and they can actually be quite vulnerable to being assaulted by, by other patients. So, um, you know, or, or maybe being exploited. So uh, it's really important, so particularly on mixed wards, and I, I uh, have a mixed ward at uh, Old Ward, and it's, it's really important that, that nursing staff are sort of monitoring that and sort of uh, particularly thinking about what level of observations that the patient may require, because that patient could easily either com commit uh, an assault on another patient or be the victim of an assault. Um, and very often they end up going to the psychiatric intensive care unit or the PICU, uh, and that's purely because of their level of irritability and and subsequent aggression. Suspiciousness or paranoia is very often a feature uh, of the manic patient and you know what you'll often find with these patients is that they, they are really quite guarded in their approach that it's a bit of a struggle trying to uh, get much in the way of history from them. Um, and as I mentioned earlier you get this marked disruption of social occupational functioning and that's really what brings this person into hospital because you know, patients with hypomania very often can be managed in the community with increased monitoring uh, from the crisis resolution and home treatment team. Um, but uh, with manic patients, you get significant disturbance of, of family life and, and social activities and, and they can't work and, and very often uh, family members um, just cannot cope with them. So what do we mean about, by hypomania then? Well, hypomania, as I said, it's a, it's a dampened down uh, version of um, and essentially what you have is three or more of the characteristic symptoms that I've listed on a previous slide. And, and the time duration is, is different. It's only 
four days as opposed to seven. Um, and we, we said it's kind of elevated or irritable mood, but not to the same extent as mania. And it, it's clearly got to be different from the individual's normal mood. And I guess, um, you know, I, I use the term normal quite loosely there and, and in inverted commas, because what, what, what is normal? And I suppose what we mean by that is um, normal for that particular individual. OK, but as I mentioned, in hypomania, you don't normally get that level of interference in terms of social or occupational functioning. So very often these patients don't require admission to hospital. But the caveat to that is uh, what can often happen is that they end up uh, becoming manic. So it's really important that they are monitored closely, that they are treated assertively so that we can uh, ensure that the mood doesn't continue to uh, become more and more elevated and become more and more irritable. And the other thing about uh, hypermania is that you don't get psychotic features. So if there are psychotic features present in the patient who presents with elevated irritable mood, it's mania, it's not hypomania. Okay, so you don't get psychotic features in, in hypomania. And that's one of the sort of chief ways of differentiating hypomania from mania. Okay, and I've said already that it's, um, it's essentially shared, the clinical symptoms uh, of, of hypomania are the same as those of mania, but they're evident to a lesser degree, okay. Um, so what about treatment then? Well, I think first and foremost, and I suppose I would say this to any of you that are budding uh, GPs, is uh, make sure that if you've got a patient whose mood is becoming elevated, that you absolutely stop any antidepressant medication that that patient is prescribed. Um, I think sometimes uh, we, we get a bit concerned and certainly GPs get quite concerned about stopping antidepressant medication abruptly. Um, and rightly so in the patient with depression, because that can lead to discontinuation uh, symptoms. And I know there's been a lot of um, coverage in the media about antidepressant withdrawal and discontinuation and it being a very real phenomenon that, that people have uh, lived through. But it's really important in mania and hypermania that you just stop the antidepressant abruptly, because that is not going to help the patient who's manic or hypermanic. So, so absolutely, if they're on 40 milligrams of fluoxetine, just stop the fluoxetine 40 milligrams don't reduce the dose to 20 milligrams for a week and then stop. And the mainstay of treatment, certainly in the acute phase, is uh, antipsychotic medication. And it's really important that you get this on board as quickly as possible. And um, I mean, there are several antipsychotic medications that are licensed for use. And, and certainly the, the, the go-to uh, ones for me uh, would always be olanzapine, risperidone or quetiapine. Uh, and the nice thing about those particular antipsychotics is that not only will they treat the um, mania or the hypermania, they also have a significant sedative effect. So they will help that patient to sleep. And actually what that can do is that can sometimes negate the need for use of hip and not like Zolpidem or Zopiclone, um, which I think are massively overprescribed on the wards. Um, but the other nice thing as well about particularly Risperidone and Lanzapine is you can give them in aura dispersible form. So it dissolves the, under the tongue. So if you've got a patient who's manic or hypermanic, but whose insight is really quite limited, uh, then what you can do is you can give them the oral dispersible form. And that's a way of ensuring that they're getting treatment on board. Now, there are a couple of other antipsychotics that are used to treat uh, mania. So aripiprazole is one, for instance, but um, I don't particularly tend to use it, mainly because I don't find it um, as effective in the acute phase of a manic or hypermanic episode. Uh, but also it doesn't have that sedative effect. Um, and then we've got haloperidol, which you've probably come across on the ward, which is one of the oldest antipsychotics that we have, a first generation antipsychotic, which is a very effective anti-manic agent, but tends to have very unpleasant side effects, what we call extrapyramidal side effects. So particularly the muscle stiffness and um, the akathisia, subjective motor restlessness. Now, unfortunately, lots of my patients, when they come onto the ward and they get admitted uh, and in the acutely manic state, they, they don't want to accept oral medication. And really, that's um, an indication of uh, a real lack of insight into their presentation. So lots of patients with mania do not accept that they have mania and do not accept that they require uh, any sort of anti-manic medication. So we end up having to use uh, depot medication, which is injectable and psychotic medication. Now, obviously, that would never be a first choice. Um, and, you know, even the patient that sort of asks for a depot injection uh, as a preference, I would always sort of question, why, why is that the case? And, um, you know, it's important to remember that often when, you know, we're, we're sort of managing patients on the ward, when they're in a state of acute distress, you know, having to have a depot can be even more um, distressing for that patient and can be quite triggering as well if there's histories of previous trauma 
um, particularly you know previous um, physical or sexual abuse then you know having a depot and needing to be restrained to have a depot that can be really traumatizing for a patient and have very long lasting effects so you know obviously oral medication is is the less um, restrictive and much preferred option if, if at all possible um, quite often what we, what I will do is um, have to use a depot medication uh, in the first instance maybe for a few weeks and then we switch the person to an oral uh, antipsychotic medication once the level of insight has improved um, now one of the things that we need to be very careful about in psychiatry uh, and this is across the board really in all uh, in the management of all mental disorders is use of benzodiazepines um, and I think you know historically benzodiazepines were, were, were massively overused and patients were prescribed benzodiazepines for years and years uh, and no one ever battered an eyelid or made any attempt to take them off the benzodiazepines um, and, and I still find this even today that, that you know there are patients who've been on benzodiazepines for years and it, they're very resistant to trying to take them off the benzodiazepines. Now it's important to remember that with this particular class of uh, drug that um, patients quite quickly become dependent uh, or build up a tolerance to the benzodiazepine so if you're on a regular benzodiazepine for longer than three or four weeks uh, then you, 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 what will then happen is you become dependent. Um, and what happens is that you build up your tolerance so that you need higher and higher doses of the benzodiazepine to achieve the same uh, calming or sedating or anxiolytic effects. That said, uh, in the acutely manic patient, I have a very low threshold for using benzodiazepines, uh, at least on a, a short-term basis. Um, and I suppose ultimately what you can think about is either going with a sort of more medium acting benzodiazepine like diazepam uh, two or three times a day, or sometimes you may want to go with a sort of shorter acting benzodiazepine. So lorazepam or clonazepam are the two short acting benzos that we, that we commonly use on the ward. Um, and we would you know, be looking to review that prescription on a regular basis and looking to, to stop it uh, you know, as, as soon as possible. And if the patient is on the regular benzodiazepine for longer than three or four weeks, then what you really need to think about is tapering the dose rather than stopping it abruptly. So you taper and gradually reduce. And lots of these patients will not have slept uh, for days on end. And you know you really need to ensure that, that actually sleep is, is an important part of the treatment plan. Uh, and I always say this to patients that you know in terms of recovery from mental ill health, sleep is a really, really important aspect of that. And, um, it is acceptable to use a hypnotic and, and we typically use Zop Zopiclone or Zolpidem uh, to assist with sleep. But again, a bit like with the benzodiazepines, it's really important that patients are not prescribed hypnotics on a long term basis. Um, and, you know, sometimes people say, well, which is better to give Zopiclone or Zolpidem? I mean, essentially, uh, the only difference between them is, is the half life. So Zolpidem has a half life of two or three hours, whereas Zopiclone's half life is sort of five, between five and six hours. So I always say to patients, the Zopiclone is going to work for longer, um, but I, I certainly have patients who swear by Zolpidem working and Zopiclone not working. So, you know, if you have a patient that doesn't respond to one of the Z drugs, certainly consider prescribing the other one. Um, and in terms of doses with Zopiclone, you should only ever give a maximum of 7.5 milligrams at night uh, in any general adult patient. So uh, up to the age of 65 and beyond the age of 65, really you should just be giving 3.75 milligrams rather than the 7.5. And then with Zolpidem, you can either give five or 10 milligrams. So again, in the over 65 patient, perhaps five milligrams at night. Uh, in the patient under 65, 10 milligrams at night. Um, but again, a bit like with the benzodiazepine, you need to monitor that prescription uh, closely, okay? And stop the uh, hypnotic asm when you can. So what about bipolar depression? I, I spoke a little bit about this uh, earlier. And um, you know, from a clinical features perspective, very similar to, to unipolar depression. So Shagan will have spoken to you before about the uh, core symptoms of depression of low mood, anergia and anhedonia, and then biological and cognitive features of depression. Well, the same is true in bipolar depression in terms of the presentation. What you do tend to find is in terms of the sort of nature of the presentation that they tend to um, occur more rapidly, um, more acutely than unipolar depressive episodes, and they tend to be more severe uh, and often more frequent. Um, and what you can get as well is, uh, you know, uh, delusional thinking. So you can um, have sort of um, more sort of persecutory delusional beliefs or perhaps nihilistic uh, delusional beliefs or delusions of poverty. Um, and, you know, that can be a feature of bipolar depression. Uh, and it's 
it's interesting in terms of how we treat bipolar depression. You know, I, I always thought when I started working in psychiatry as a, as a trainee that, that we would treat it in the same way as unipolar depression because um, surely uh, at a neurotransmitter level, you know, we want to achieve the same goal. So let's give this person antidepressants. Um, but actually what, what you find is that if you give uh, antidepressants to patients with bipolar depression, it only actually works in about 50% of patients. So you will have a significant proportion that don't even really respond to, to the antidepressant. Uh, and yet despite this, I think, um, you know, across the board really, and certainly I've seen lots of patients with bipolar depression who are started on antidepressant medication, some of whom do respond, uh, in which case, you know, you can't argue with that as a treatment. And so long as you're very mindful that there is the risk of flipping the patient into hypermania, uh, and certainly if you are going to use an antidepressant, then an SSRI type antidepressant like fluoxetine or sertraline is much safer to use than uh, non-SSRI like venlafaxine or metazapine. Um, but what we know is that there's not many studies looking at this actually. Um, and this is one of the problems really in terms of trying to uh, build up an evidence base and trying to sort of um, use the, the, the best possible treatment. So, um, you know, one of the uh, best studied treatments for bipolar depression is a, the combination of olanzapine plus fluoxetine. Uh, and that seems to be uh, more effective in treating bipolar depression uh, than uh, any uh, single antidepressant on its own. Uh, and I tend to avoid use of SSRIs in treating bipolar depression um, unless the patient is already established on a particular um, SSRI prior to coming into hospital. Um, I think there's the danger sometimes that we think uh, let's chop and change a patient's medications and actually what you run the risk of is making that patient a lot worse before you make them better. Um, and I think one of the really important learning points here is to take on board the need to ask patients, you know, when, when you've been depressed like this before, since your bipolar diagnosis, what's really worked for you? What, what treatment helped you? Or what, what treatment was most beneficial? Because actually, if it worked previously, it's much more likely it's gonna work again, okay? So um, that's why it's really important that that, that patient involvement uh, is considered in terms of treatment choice. But what about other treatments? Well, um, my favorite uh, um, medications, uh, you know, in terms of treated bipolar depression would really be quetiapine and lamotrigine. Um, and I think quetiapine is an incredibly useful psychotropic medication because, you know, we not only use it in treating psychosis and schizophrenia uh, up to 750 milligrams in a day, but it's, it's also used obviously in acute mania, as I've said, but it, it's licensed for use in major depressive disorder as well. So it'd be a very effective uh, antidepressant. And, and you probably heard from Shagan that, um, you know, in those patients with more difficult to treat depression that fails to respond to one or two antidepressants, by adding in some quetiapine, uh, that can really uh, help that patient to recover. So we use quetiapine a lot in bipolar depression. And lamotrigine, again, it's just something that you, you've probably uh, heard of um, if you've done uh, your neurology placement because it's very commonly used as an anticonvulsant, but we use it a lot in uh, the treatments of uh, bipolar disorder. And lamotrigine has been shown to provide prophylaxis against bipolar depression. So um, one of the things that's important to think about when you've got a bipolar patient in front of you is, you know, asking that person, do they have more uh, episodes of becoming manic or, and hypermanic or becoming depressed. And if they have more depressive rather than manic or hypermanic episodes, then lamotrigine would be a sensible option uh, in terms of treatment and providing prophylaxis because it's clearly shown to provide some protective benefits um, to reduce the likelihood of further depressive episodes. Now, one of the things about lamotrigine you have to be very careful of is that um, it has to be titrated really slowly. Um, so we generally uh, go up to doses of 400 milligrams daily, but you have to start it at sort of 25 milligrams twice a day or 50 milligrams once a day and increase it in fortnightly intervals. Um, and one of the reasons for that is lots of patients who are prescribed lamotrigine develop skin rash. So about 8% of patients who, who get prescribed lamotrigine uh, report skin rash as a side effect. And for some patients, that's not particularly troublesome, but for others, uh, it can be really quite significant. And I've certainly seen this uh, on the wards uh, in practice. Um, and then the sodium valparate or, or uh, Depakote, semi-sodium valparate, which is um, more or less the same thing, slightly different, but more or less the same thing. This is something that we absolutely can't use 
in patients who are uh, childbearing. Um, and the reason for that is down to um, the teratogenic uh, effects. And actually, uh, there is a significant increased risk of neural tube defects, such as spina bifida, associated with sodium uh, valproate, as well as risk of cognitive impairment. So it, it's, it's thought to reduce um, average IQ in the um, newborn by approximately 10 points. So we, we tend to avoid Depakote in women of childbearing potential, but certainly in women over the age of um, 45, 50, then it's certainly reasonable uh, to think about Depakote in that instance. And just as a caveat, one of the things you have to be careful about with sodium valproate is um, liver function blood tests. It can cause derangement of liver function blood tests. So you do need to monitor them on a six monthly basis. And then we've also got lithium carbonate as well. Um, and lithium carbonate is an incredibly um, effective medication in treating bipolar depression, but also unipolar depression. Uh, but the thing about lithium carbonate that you've got to be careful about is the need to monitor the serum level because it's one of those medications that has a really narrow therapeutic index or narrow therapeutic window. Um, so you have to monitor the serum lithium level on a three monthly basis. So it does require regular blood monitoring and that can be something that some patients don't particularly um, ag agree with or like. So that can often be um, a stumbling block to getting patients to take lithium carbonate, but it's certainly uh, an effective treatment and there is a clear uh, suicide lowering or anti-suicidal effect associated with lithium carbonate and that's well studied and reproduced um, in the literature and it's important to remember that antidepressant medication can itself precipitate manic or hypermanic episodes and I have seen this uh, where patients have been starting antidepressants and then quickly become hypermanic or manic uh, and you have, we've had to stop the antidepressant really quite um, quite abruptly. So obviously in an ideal world, what we want is to prevent uh, patients with bipolar effect disorder having significant mood episodes. And I think it's important that this is how we practice really, because ultimately, um, you know, um, having significant mood episodes can be really quite destabilizing. Very often it means a spell in hospital. Uh, and typically if you're manic, that will mean detained under the Mental Health Act. So when we think about prophylaxis, essentially the mainstay of treatment and, and sort of first line is use of a mood stabilizer, okay? And the time to have this discussion about starting mood stabilizer is not when the patient's acutely manic, because you're not going to be able to get that patient to um, consider the need for and agree to commence uh, a mood stabilizer. So um, I always wait until, you've, uh, until I've treated their manic episode, and then once they're back to a euthymic or normal mood state, uh, then I have a discussion with them about uh, the need to go on mood stabilizing medication and why that's gonna be helpful, okay. Uh, and first line treatment is still lithium carbonate or Depakote. Uh, and again, I've just highlighted in bold that the, the Depakote should not be used in women of childbearing potential because of its teratogenicity. Okay, so that's a very easy exam question and certainly something that, that you need to uh, take on board um, you know, uh, in, in, in your future careers because you'll see lots of patients even within primary care who are still on sodium valproate or Depakote uh, who, who really should be taken, taken off. Second line uh, then is, is carbamazepine. And again, some of you uh, will have heard of carbamazepine. It's an anticonvulsant uh, that's used a lot in epilepsy, but we also use it a lot in bipolar affective disorder. But you have to be very careful about using carbamazepine because what it can do is actually lower the serum levels of other medications that the patient's co-prescribed. Um, and that's, that can be particularly uh, significant, for example, in the young female who's on the oral contraceptive pill. So if they're on carbamazepine as well, what can happen is the oral contraceptive pill becomes less effective because, because the carbamazepine reduces uh, the serum level. And that's because it's a cytochrome uh, P450 enzyme inducer. Okay, so the other thing with carbamazepine as well is a bit like with Depakote, um, you have to monitor liver function blood tests on a six monthly basis. So they can cause derangement of liver function blood tests. And very rarely, carbamazepine can also cause uh, pancreatitis. So, um, you know, these patients do require quite close monitoring. Okay. Um, and then I mentioned about lamotrigine. There is absolutely no evidence for using lamotrigine in patients with bipolar disorder who become manic or hypermanic. So certainly you should never use lamotrigine uh, to uh, treat manic or hypermanic episodes. Um, lithium and Depakote, on the other hand, if, if, if you had a patient who was manic or hypermanic and you commenced them on lithium, 
car carbonate or depicodes, you would be able to treat their manic episode, but it would take a lot longer than it would with antipsychotic medication. So you'd be talking two or three weeks as opposed to uh, two or three days. Um, now, one of the things I think we often uh, you know, um, get accused of in psychiatry is uh, the fact that you know, we're very medically model, uh, we're very medical model minded. And uh, I think this is something that we, we really have to move away from. And uh, often we, we hear about this idea of the biopsychosocial approach. And, and there's no doubt in my mind uh, that for a lot of patients, actually it's not the pharmacological interventions um, that they're particularly keen for or want to continue long term, but more uh, psychotherapeutic interventions. OK, so um, looking at psychological therapy um, and it's important to recognize that there is a there is a clear evidence base behind using psychological therapy as a treatment uh, for bipolar affective disorder. Um, and I think sometimes we, we, we forget that and perhaps particularly in the inpatient setting, it's very easy to remember to, to medicate the patient who's who manic, but actually um, what we also have to be thinking about is how do we then um, educate that person about the condition uh, and how do we increase the likelihood of that person staying well and not having further relapses? Well, a good starting point is psychoeducation. And, you know, this is something that, um, you know, not just doctors can, can engage with, with, with patients. It's something that um, nursing staff can do, uh, that psychologists uh, of all levels can do. Uh, and arguably even uh, peer support workers, so um, previous patients or what we call experts by experience on the wards can often be well placed to do psychoeducation uh, about bipolar affective disorder. You know, what is it? Uh, how does it present? What are the clinical features? And how do you recognize warning signs that you're becoming a little bit unwell? And maybe how do you recognize, uh, um, you know, warning signs that you're becoming very unwell? So my patients very often will, will do what's called a staying well or a relapse prevention plan. And that's a really important part uh, of uh, the management of bipolar affective disorder, um, arguably more important than the medication. But there's also uh, a clear evidence base for using specific modalities of psychological therapy. Um, and I think, um, you know, the three types that, that, that you know, are commonly used are CBT, interpersonal therapy and family therapy. And you may or may not have heard of these, uh, certainly with CBT and interpersonal therapy, uh, they're, they're definitely um, used in the treatment of depression and the NICE guideline recommended. Uh, CBT is much more widely available, uh, certainly within the NHS, uh, as opposed to interpersonal therapy. Um, and if I'm honest, certainly within Mersey Care, the mental health trust I work in, uh, I've met very few patients that have been able to access or been offered interpersonal therapy. But it is certainly NICE guideline recommended. So. Um, you absolutely need to know about it as a, as a form of psychological therapy that can be used. And then there's also family therapy as well. And I guess this is particularly useful at the start of the bipolar journey for a patient. Um, and Shagan may well have mentioned, or sorry, Krishna may well have mentioned in his schizophrenia talk about uh, family therapy as being a, a therapeutic intervention in schizophrenia or in first steps of psychosis. It's nice guideline recommended. Uh, and something that all patients with first episode of psychosis should be offered and certainly will be offered if they're under the care of the early intervention psychosis team. But there is also a role for family therapy in bipolar disorder. So again, it's something you should be aware of for exam purposes that, that um, you know, in terms of psychotherapy, psychotherapeutic intervention is perfectly valid. And then something that I think we're less good at doing, and I think uh, that, that, you know, I'm guilty of myself is perhaps not having enough knowledge about uh, support groups okay and very often this is where uh, the ward ot will come in useful because they will be more aware of uh, what's available in terms of local support groups but i think it's really important to a lot of patients that they were they're aware that actually you know they're not alone with this diagnosis that actually this is a very common diagnosis um, and actually they can meet people who've gone through similar experiences and i think that can be incredibly uh, powerful um, in terms of a patient's journey uh, once, the, once that diagnosis is made. So I think it's really important that we signpost them to local groups and make them aware of organisations like Bipolar UK and saying uh, the MIND website is fantastic. Um, I very often uh, signpost patients to the patient information leaflets uh, on uh, the MIND website because I think they're absolutely fantastic and they're written very much um, avoiding uh, using medical jargon and very much, um, you know, in lay person language, which is obviously important. So it's important to, to remember that that's an important aspect of, of the um, treatment plan, not, not just medication.
Okay, so uh, that's all I wanted to say about bipolar affective disorder. So I'm just going to see if there's uh, any questions that... Um, uh, okay, so I've got a question from uh, Danny. So uh, how would you differentiate between a manic episode and a psychotic episode? As they would both uh, present with forms of psychotic symptoms. That's a really interesting question. Um, so what I would say uh, in response to that is... In, in a manic episode, what, what is quite clear is that you've not only got the psychotic symptoms, but you've also got the affective symptoms as well. Okay, so you've got the, um, you've got the two together. Whereas in a psychotic episode, what you will have is you, you don't really have the mood components. So the psychotic patient, it's often very difficult. And I think sometimes um, I would argue we, we, we try to split hairs. Uh, and I think we're guilty sometimes in psychiatry. Um, you know, particularly in the inpatient setting of trying to sort of um, almost uh, label people or put people into diagnostic slots where actually it's not really very clear. And lots of patients with psychosis will have a mood type uh, presentation as well. And it may well be uh, you think someone's psychotic, but actually a more, um, a more accurate representation of the diagnosis is manic episode with psychotic symptoms. Um, ultimately, it doesn't really matter because the treatment is exactly the same. So you would treat that person with antipsychotic medication. Um, so, um, you know, the only, um, I suppose the only instance in which that would matter is when you're doing a sort of discharge summary or when you're having a, a, di a discussion with a patient or family about, uh, you know, diagnosis when they say to you, so what's, what's my diagnosis? Um, so I've got another question here about, um, in terms of uh, finals undergraduate level, how much detail would we be expected to know about psychiatric management. So um, what would I expect you to know? Uh, and I suppose, you know, I'm well placed to, to tell you because I, I write a lot of the undergraduate questions. I would expect you to, to know about the basic pharmacological management, okay? So I would not expect you to be able to uh, name all of the antipsychotics that are licensed for use to treat the manic patient, but I would expect you to know the names of maybe one or two uh, antipsychotic medications. And I suppose the easy way of remembering that is think of the second generation newer antipsychotics, okay? They are what we typically use, the quetiapines, the risperidones, the olanzapines, okay? Um, I'd expect you to know that um, there is a role for psychological therapy and to know the names of one or two types of psychological therapy that we would use. So for example, family therapy in the patient with schizophrenia, or for example, cognitive behavioral therapy and cognitive analytic therapy uh, in the patient with uh, depression. Okay, so um, I think I, I would say um, in a nutshell in response to that, not a great deal of detail. Certainly I'm not going to ask you in an exam, what's the half-life of risperidone or what's the maximum dose of quetiapine, but clearly you need to know the, the, the names of these medications. And that's an important thing uh, to know uh, regardless of um, which specialty you go into, uh, particularly those of you that are in general practice where a quarter of your consultations will be mental health related. Um, <clears throat> and there's another question here. Um, so from the different arms of treatment that we've seen, are there some things that are more pertinent than others uh, at undergraduate level? Um, I think from a basic understanding uh, perspective, what I would say is, um, you know, you need to have, uh, a, you know, a good understanding of pharmacological treatments, okay? Um, because ultimately, uh, that's, you know, bread and butter as a uh, psychiatrist, as a, as a doctor working with people with mental health issues. So, um, you know, the, psych the, the pharmacological treatments are what I would have you to have a really good understanding of. Um, but in terms of psychological uh, therapies, what I don't expect is for you to be able to tell me, you know, how, how does CBT work? How long is the course of CBT? Can, you know, can you explain uh, for five marks what CBT involves? That wouldn't be expected in an exam. But you might be expected, to, for example, as I mentioned earlier, to be able to name, you know, a type of psychological therapy that's um, indicated for the patient that's depressed. So cognitive behavior therapy or interpersonal therapy or cognitive analytic therapy, maybe. OK. Um, there's a question from uh, Anthony Feeney here about loosening associations and night's mood thinking. I don't know whether that's related to an earlier talk, but I'm happy to um, happy to answer the question before I move on to my next talk. So um, <clears throat> loosening association night's mood thinking yes effectively they're the same thing often it's often referred to as uh, thought derailments okay uh, and you know the idea behind this is that what the patient is saying is not making any sense at all so 
when you ask the patient a question, for example, when you say, you know, what's the weather like outside, they start talking about something completely unrelated. And what, what they may well do is even start um, mixing up the uh, uh, word ordering. So you get what's called word salad, and it makes even less sense. And actually the difficulty when you have the patient with night's move thinking or loosening of association is very often you don't get any sort of relevance or pertinent history. Um, and often it, it, you know, it will become pretty apparent. You know, I think sometimes we think, well, how do I, how do I ask the patient whether they've got loosening of association or night's move thinking? Well, the answer to that is quite simply, you don't need to because it's very obvious in front of you. Um, the patient is not able to converse in, in, a, in a logical, uh, coherent way. Okay, so, um, you know, when we think about positive symptoms, formal thought disorder, you don't need to ask about it. It's, it's very much evident in front of you. And it just highlights the need to really pay attention to um, the patient's uh, presentation, really observe the patient quite, quite closely whilst you're taking a history. Um, any other questions about uh, bipolar disorder at all, uh, or any of the material that, that uh, has been um, covered in any of the earlier talks, or I will move on to the next uh, talk uh, for me. Um, right, okay, this is an interesting role, role for ECT in bipolar disorder. Yeah, this is very interesting. So um, ECT in bipolar disorder, not commonly used. Um, I, in my four years as a consultant, six years as a trainee, I think I remember one patient with mania uh, treated with ECT, and it was a lady in her 50s or 60s when I was working in Chester, uh, and I was on the psychiatric intensive care unit. Um, as a core trainee uh, and we gave her ECT and she had about 16 sessions of ECT uh, and it didn't really make any difference. Um, so if you look at nice guidelines for ECT then intractable or difficult to treat mania is listed as one. Um, in reality we don't tend to use it. Um, I think ECT um, is kind of um, you know one of those uh, biological treatments that are, unfortunately I think is going uh, out of fashion a little bit now, which I think is um, a great shame actually, because it's incredibly effective and gets an awful lot of bad press. Uh, you know, in a patient who's bipolar depressed, um, you know, who's not responding to, to pharmacological treatment, then certainly uh, I would consider ECT in any depressed patients, you know, particularly if they have a psychotic depression, uh, you know, it can be life-saving for some patients uh, in terms of, you know, if they're not eating, not drinking, um, you know, these are patients that are potentially going into acute kidney injury and are going to end up on the general medical ward with IV fluids. Um, so uh, ECT, there, there is a role for it, but certainly much more commonly used in unipolar uh, depression rather than bipolar depression. Um, can cyclothymia remain undiagnosed? Absolutely. I, I think there's lots of patients with cyclothymia who come to the attention of uh, secondary care, who get seen within the community mental health team setting, uh, who, who get um, wrongly diagnosed uh, with having bipolar effect disorder, whereas actually what they really have is cyclothymia. And I think cyclothymia is a diagnosis that's really underused, probably because not a lot of people know about it. And I would argue that even not a lot of psychiatrists uh, would regularly consider it on a differential diagnosis. But certainly if you've got that patient that's sort of highly functioning, um, seems to have those sub-thresholds, uh, subclinical mood uh, episodes, um, and doesn't really respond to mood stabilizing medication the way you would expect them, then cyclothymia should be considered, okay? And cyclothymic patients don't really need to be under the care of uh, mental health services. They should be able to be um, managed within primary care. Um, okay, and uh, just, uh, I'll do a couple more questions. So you've got a question about ECT. Is it contraindicated in people on anti-epileptic medication? Uh, if so, is what alternative treatment is available? Um, Yes, yeah, so this is an interesting uh, question. So obviously, um, if you're on anti-epileptic medication, the whole idea behind ECT is what you're doing is you're inducing um, a uh, motor and an EEG seizure. So, um, you know, lots of patients that have ECT, so patients with difficult to treat depression, will be on lithium carbonate. And often uh, what, what you do is reduce the dose of um, the uh, lithium carbonate, um, you know, and if they're on any other anti-epileptic medication, you would want to think about reducing the dose of uh, said medication if at all possible, because otherwise what's going to happen is you're going to need to deliver a higher stimulus to evoke the EEG and motor seizure. Um, so it could be a tricky one. So similarly with um, benzodiazepines, with patients who are on regular diazepam, for example, tends to mean they need higher stimulus uh, for ECT. So you have to 
deliver them a higher dose of ECT to, to get the same level of response. Um, okay, so there's a question here about overlap between bipolar disorder and dual personality disorder. So are patients with um, DPD, I'm assuming that's dissociative personality disorder, or I'm wondering whether you mean by, um, borderline personality disorder, BPD, often misdiagnosed with bipolar, or are they very much different from one another? Um, yeah, this is a really interesting question. I, I could spend the next hour talking about this, so I need to uh, be careful that I don't do that. But in a nutshell, uh, yes, there is, um, there is a lot of overshadowing between um, borderline personality disorder and bipolar affective disorder. And we know lots of patients with borderline personality disorder will also have bipolar affective disorder. And similarly, we know that lots of patients with a diagnosis of bipolar disorder actually have a diagnosis of emotions hate personality disorder. So, um, uh, you know, this, it, I guess, if anything, it just highlights the large amount of gray that we have in terms of diagnosis of mental disorders. And it's not as simple as black and white. There's a lot of, there's an awful lot of gray. Um, so thoughts on lithium, right, well, I better make this the final question. So thoughts on lithium and water supply for population level suicide risk reduction. Um, yeah, really interesting question. Uh, something I've not really considered. Um, if you look at the literature though, there is certainly uh, an anti-suicidal effect of lithium. Uh, and this is why for me, lithium carbonate is very much a go-to medication in depressed patients, particularly the more difficult to treat or the treatment refractory uh, patients, um, because you know that there is shown to be reduced suicidal effects, and uh, that's been consistently demonstrated. Whether or not we could start pumping uh, national water supplies full of lithium, I, I'm not sure how ethical or moral that would be, but it's certainly an interesting uh, uh, proposal, um, and I'm not sure whether that's ever been studied. So, uh, a, a provoking uh, thought to finish on. Um,